What's up, Sea Roaders? Good to see you all here today. And those online, we are so glad that you are joining with us. This is week two of a small little series we've called The Greatest Hits, looking at some of what I believe to be the best parts of the book of Psalms as we kind of like bridge the gap between Halloween and, you know, Christmas. Uh, that thing's coming up. And in four weeks' time, we're going to launch our Christmas series. It's going to be a lot of fun to dig into that together. We're going to start off a little bit differently today. How many of you are excited? Yay! <laughs> Woo! Because some of you are like, okay, every time Jason says different, I get a little bit nervous. All it's going to require is a little bit of crowd participation, standing up or sitting down. And even at home, you can do the same thing, or you can write your answers into your uh, chat of choice there at YouTube. So here's what we're going to do. If, if you're able and you're willing, please stand up. Stand up if you're able and you're willing, okay? We're going to play a little game called Name That Tune or Name That Movie, okay? What I'm going to do is I am going to say a line from a movie or a line from a song, and if you know it, I want you to stay standing. Don't say it out loud. Don't tell your neighbor. Don't nudge them and give them the wink wink or anything like that. Don't say it out loud. Just stay standing. If you have no clue where that is from, this is the honor system, friends. Just sit back down. Nobody's going to think less of you if you don't know these things. Is everybody ready to play? Okay, first line, here it is. Life is like a box of chocolates. Life is like a box of chocolates. Don't say it out yet. If you don't know it, sit down. If you know it or you think you know it, stay standing. All right, final answers locked in. All right, on the count of three, we're going to yell this out together what we think the answer is. One, two, three. Okay, those of you who said Forrest Gump, you are correct. Those who just played along and said, I think it's this, you're still in the game. Way to go. Okay, here's the second one. Here's the second one. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. If you do not know what it is, start sitting down. If you know what it is or you think you know, stay standing. Stay standing. All right, on the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Beatles. The Beatles or Help, the song. Yeah, right? It, we gave you a teaser. Help, I need somebody. Help. Okay, here we go. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> okay, if you're standing and you think you know it, if you don't know it, sit back down. All right, on three. One, two, three. Perfect. Perfect. Well done. Okay. Let's go with, with the bonus round question here. Are we ready? Hold me close, tiny dancer. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Elton John, tiny dancer. Okay, we helped you out. Go ahead, grab a seat. Thanks for playing along today, friends. I wish I could shower you with free pizza, but I do not have that. Here's what's interesting. Culturally, we absorb information rapidly all the time. And there are certain things that stick with us in our heart and in our memories that just kind of last the, the test of time. doesn't matter where we are or who we're with. If somebody mentions a line from a movie or a line from a song that had some sort of impact on us, we're instantly transported back into that space and that time and that moment where we first heard that experience. For some of us, it's the time that we held the hand of our crush for the very first time. The Flintstones movie for me, that's what it is. <laughs> I got to tell you, instantly transported right back to that moment. The fear, the pain, the anxiety, it's all good. Sometimes for some of us, it's a memory of a loved one that is no longer with us. A favorite song comes on the radio and our heart begins to breathe and our tears well up in our eyes and that's a good thing. 
For others of us, we're in a moment in a time where we have a soundtrack narrative that accompanies a specific portion of, of, of time or an experience in our lives. For me, when I led a, kid, a, a group of high schoolers to Mexico, it's my, my friend's band called The Fonts. They released their EP album, and I listened to that ad nauseum during that trip because it was better than listening to whiny, complaining teenagers and their parents. It was the worst. It was a great trip, though, by the way. I love it. So every time I hear those songs, I'm transported back to those spaces. Every time we hear something or we see something or we watch something, it evokes, it conjures up some sort of emotional response in us. And that is a healthy and a good thing because we are made to feel. We are made to breathe. We are made to worship. We're going to be digging into Psalm chapter 8 today. And so if you've got a Bible with you and you want to follow along with me, please open it up to Psalm chapter 8. If you're thinking to yourself, Jason, I'd love to follow along with you, but it's a little bit dark in this space. Good news. We're going to be redoing our lighting here before Christmas, Lord willing, so they'll be bright enough for you to bring your Bible with you if you have one. If you don't have one, Please come see me or one of our staff team after the service. We want to gift you with a Bible so you can take it home, you can read it, whatever. If you have a cellular device, though, you can go on to your App Play Store, you know, Google Play or the App Store on uh, iPhone and download Version Bible app. Follow along there uh, with reading the Bible and having access to it right in the moment, which is always fun to be able to do. Psalm chapter 8, I'm going to be reading all nine verses simultaneously, starting in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals... That you should think about them, human beings, that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and, and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O Lord, Our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. The book of Psalms was written by a various number of authors. One of the most prominent authors who has got a lot of these Psalms attributed to his penmanship and inspiration with the living presence of God helping him write these things is is a man named David. And this just happens to be one of the many psalms that David is granted or considered the author of, Psalm chapter 8. There's three ideas from this psalm that I want to unpack for us here today. And it's all around this concept and this idea of worship. Because you and I, we are created to worship. And worship is this devotion response to something that is awe-inspiring. That's the Jason definition of what worship is. This devotion response to something that is awe-inspiring. And so there's kind of three elements that I'm going to touch on that Psalm 8 starts to paint this, this picture for us. The first is this phrase, reverence of God reverence of God. That's not a word that we use a lot in our language today, the word reverence. We've heard of maybe somebody named Paul Revere. Anybody heard about Paul Revere before? Okay, I'm the only one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, some of you have heard about Paul Revere. Okay, it's not a a play on his last name. Reverence, the word reverence actually means a, a good synonym is devotion. Devotion or commitment. Reverence of God. Psalm 8 starts to paint this picture because of who God is and the way that he's created all things. One of the choices that we have as humankind is to revere God. To respond in reverence of God. This devotion to God. And what's brilliant about this is it's not a coercion of any kind. God does not force us to love him. God does not force us to think only good thoughts about who he is. 
God has created our world in which we live. God has created our individual lives, the people that we're connected to, those that we like, those that we don't like, those that we wish would be under a bus. He's created all of those people, all of the things in our world because of love. And because of this blank tapestry, this masterpiece that we now live into, we have an opportunity to respond for all that God has done for us. The response that I believe the author of this particular portion of Scripture, Psalm 8, David, what he's trying to conjure up inside of us, inspire us towards, is this reverence of God. Unhindered devotion to a creator who's desperately in love with you and with me. Our culture is known for a lot of things right now here today in 2022. Devotion and commitment is not one of them. We live in a fickle, ever-changing society and culture. We trade relationships like they're bubblegum. Hubba Bubba style. Pop one of those in your mouth, the flavor's gone after 30 seconds, spit it out, go get another piece. Devotion and commitment are foreign concepts for many of us, myself included. Now, there are many gifts and privileges that come along with being a lifelong Maple Leafs fan. (laughs) This is one of them. Being a Leafs fan has taught me a lot about devotion and commitment. There's not a lot to celebrate when you're a Leafs fan. Not a lot to celebrate at all. There's a win here and there. There's a Stanley Cup that was raised well before I was born. There's not a lot of things that evoke or conjure up this desire or this level of connection and commitment. Yet, the way that I am wired is once I've made my mind up about something, it's very difficult for me to change it. And I'm not unlike you. Once you've made your mind up about something, it is very difficult for us to change it. And to be honest, some of us have already made our mind up about God. And in our mind, we said God is, either doesn't exist, doesn't care, or isn't worth considering. All we need to do is start looking around us at the beautiful potpourri that exists in our lives, and we have abundant reasons to reconsider our position. Abundant options and opportunities to go deeper, to explore, to let our imagination take us forward instead of hardening our heart and refusing to consider that God intelligently designed everything and loves you so desperately and so passionately that he gives everything to pursue you. Reverence of God, a willingness to be devoted and committed to who God is. That's the blessing and the opportunity that we get to have as a human being who lives and breathes and moves. And every single human being, no matter where you are on the corner of our planet, no matter in the future if we decide that colonizing Mars is a really good idea, even the humans in that context will have the same opportunity that you and I have today to make a choice freely of our own free will of whether or not we are going to choose to be committed and devoted to who God is. My prayer, my advocacy, is that you would join along with me and so many others worldwide who love Jesus, and you would choose Jesus in all things, in all ways, at all times. I get it, that choice isn't easy some of the time. It's difficult, it's challenging, it's hard, however... It is the most freeing and fulfilling you will ever experience life to be here as a human being right now. When you make the decision to allow your heart to be settled, to have a foundation from which to live and breathe and move, knowing that there's a God who cares, 
who, who weathers every single storm alongside of you and isn't there to punish you when you get out of line, but is there to give you a big cosmic hug and remind you that you are worth it, even when you don't think you are. That's reverence of God. The other thing that I want to talk about from Psalm 8 is the marvel of God. Marvel of God. Now, marvel is an interesting word that Disney's purchased. It's now a brand, okay? I'm not talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm talking about the wonder and the awe-inspiring nature of the word marvel. I marvel at this. Imagine if you saw like a, a, a toddler, a three-year-old. This would be like the cutest thing ever. Be like, oh, I marvel at the creation. It's amazing. So those of you who've got young kids at home, that's your assignment for this week. Teach them the word marvel. It'll be epic. You'll have TikTok videos for days, okay? It'll be amazing. The marvel of God, being awe-inspired, being moved. I want you to think about the spaces that you occupy in your life, the places that you go. What inspires you the most? What evokes thoughts or ideas that aren't maybe naturally something that you think about? What causes you to pause and notice things differently in the world around you? For me, one of the things that has always been a part of my life, and I'm becoming increasingly more aware of this as I age, is moving water. It's weird. Moving water. Not standing water. Standing water is boring. Moving water, however, there's something about it that makes me think, contemplate the reality of which, in which we live, our world today, my place in the world, thoughts of God, all these things I get awe-inspired by. There's one moment and one memory in particular that stands out in my mind, because I grew up in Western Canada, and in Western Canada, the month of November looks a lot different than it does here in Eastern kind of Central Canada, okay? The month of November is filled with snow and a lot of it, Okay? A lot of snow. And so for all of my Central Alberta friends who may be listening or may be watching, we were 21 degrees yesterday and you were shoveling, so whoo! <laughs> I got a sunburn raking my neat leaves. It was awesome. <laughs> so I was hanging out with my staff team at a local coffee shop called Meeting Waters, ironically. And it's right along the Red Deer River which is a small, like, creek kind of a thing. But out west, we'll take any sort of body of water and we'll label it a river, okay? That's how desperate we are for water. And I remember that the majority of it was frozen over because it was like a February day, and February is even worse than November. And I remember thinking to myself, going like, wow, this water is frozen. How cool is that? I could walk on it, and, and I would do regularly. I'd snowshoe on the Red Deer River, Red Deer River when it was frozen over because that's just what you do when you're in Red Deer. You do fun things like that. However, during this time of prayer and this, this moment where I was interacting with the nature of, that God has created and allowing my marvel to kind of lead me wherever Jesus was leading and prompting me in the moment, Jesus reminded me that even though... What I thought was static and frozen, there is still movement beneath the surface. See, when a river freezes over, the top layer becomes ice. But guess what? If there's any sort of current that exists in that moving body of water, it is still moving underneath. That was a lifeline for me that day. It was a lifeline because I was reminded that even though in the situation, in the moment of time, in the pressures that I felt as a parent, as a pastor, as a leader, as a friend, as a husband, that even though everything may have felt stuck around me, God was still at work and God was still moving. The marvel of God causes us and invites us to think of our circumstances entirely differently. And for some of us, we have lost the art to be captivated by the wonder of who God is and what he has done and what he has created. And my invitation to you, along with the psalmist here, David, in this particular psalm, is to simply look up, marvel at the sky, See what God has done. See what he has created and allow that wonder and that sense 
of awe-inspiring nature take over and draw you into deeper, greater intimacy with the one who also created you. When you look at creation, you can see the meticulous nature that it was stitched together in. How much more can you consider the way that God has created you and me if we, out of all creation, are made in the image of our creator? What that means is he's going to take a little bit extra care in preparing you and preparing me, stitching us together meticulously, intentionally, purposefully. Even the parts of us that don't make sense. I used to tell my teenagers all the time in Western Canada that I could grow like the full circle unibrow. If I let things go here, <laughs> I've got the ability to not only connect these two bad boys in the middle, but also with the side of my head, okay? And if I shave the rest of it, I could have a perfect circle, the ring of Saturn on my face. It would be amazing. Now, I look at that and I think, Jesus, I think you made a mistake. I've got hair growing in spaces that shouldn't be there. But if I believe what the Word of God says, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of my Creator, I can bless God and thank Him even for the ability to grow a weird unibrow. The marvel of God, friends, we might not understand the way we are wired, how we are made, why we think the way we think, what we care about, but God does. And the things that we haven't yet figured out are invitations for us to get to know him, to create layers of intimate connection with him together individually, but also in community. Because guess what? We don't always see ourselves the way that God has intended us to be seen. We have an inability. Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves or too lowly of ourselves. So we need other people in our lives to remind us and encourage us to run to the Father when we start to panic. The marvel of God, the reverence of God. The last is the majesty of God. I remember growing up in church singing this song and these lyrics have stuck with me for decades. Majesty, oh worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all honor and glory and praise. I can remember where I am when I recite that line, the first time I'm singing that song, what it made me think, what it made me wonder, what it made me feel. And I was confused because the word majesty, I didn't understand what that word meant. Sometimes we use that to describe royalty. Did you know the word majesty is actually a synonym for powerful? Powerful, the majestic name of God. You could say it like this, the powerful name of God. This is why we worship Jesus as the risen king of all creation who existed before time was invented, who gave his life for you and I as a sacrifice, living and breathing once for all so that we could be reunited with our creator and experience unhindered relationship. The majestic name of Jesus is the most powerful name that has ever been in existence. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. At the name of Jesus, demons will flee. At the name of Jesus, those who are sick will find healing if that's incrementally, if that's instantaneously, or if that's being united with Christ in eternity. At the name of Jesus, and in the name of Jesus, there is hope abundant. The majesty of God, the marvel of God, the reverence of God. What a privilege it is for us to enter into those spaces. That's what worship is, this, this radical interaction of those elements and so many more. Years ago, I read this book by an author named Gary Thomas, and he talked about nine different sacred pathways. Don't worry, I ain't getting all new agey on you. Ways that we can experience God in worship. I just want to briefly highlight these for you, because you and I are a blend of these things. We'll talk about it a little bit more. They're going to be on screen here in just a moment. 
Let's talk about naturalists. These are people that love God best outdoors. These people worship in the midst of God's creation. They celebrate his majesty, his power, and discover spiritual truths about nature. Then there's sensates. They love God through their senses. These people worship through sensual experiences, sights like art, sounds like music, smells, and more. There's traditionalists. They love God through religious ritual and symbols, and these people worship through traditions and sacraments of the church. They believe structure, repetition, and rigidity, like weekly liturgy, leads to deeper understanding of God and of faith. There's the aesthetics who love God in solitude and simplicity. These people worship through prayer and quiet time in the absence of all outside noise and distraction. There's activists who love God through confrontation and fighting for godly principles and values. They worship through their dedication to and participation in God's truth about social and evangelistic causes. Then there's caregivers who love God by serving others and worship by giving of themselves. They may nurse the sick and the disabled or adopt a prisoner, donate time at a shelter, etc. There's enthusiasts who love God through mystery and celebration. These people worship with outward displays of passion and enthusiasm. They love God with gusto. And there's contemplatives who love God through adoration These people worship by their attentiveness, deep love, and intimacy, and they have an active prayer life. Finally, there's intellectuals who love God with their mind and their hearts are opened up to a new attentiveness when they understand something new about God. These people worship through intense study and apologetics and intellectual pursuits of their faith. That's a super quick overview of a big long book that I've given you in the last minute here. These are pathways, these are ways, these are ways that we can engage and grow in our worship of God. And and here's, here's what I want to say about worship in general. Worship is not about us. Each one of us, I said, are a blend of these nine expressions in that we connect more easily with God if we're doing or engaged in a particular activity than in other activities. But just because that is our preference doesn't mean that that is the only way to worship and does not mean that somebody else's expression of worship and way they connect with God is more important and more valuable than yours. Now, if we're all a blend here, and there's several hundred of us gathered in this space and many more tuned in online, imagine the challenge that it is in stitching together a worship service that engages everybody. It's nearly impossible when it's about the people in the service. But it is more possible. In fact, it's essential when it's focused about on the object of worship in general. And that here, if you haven't figured it out yet, at Sea Road is Jesus. He is the epitome of our worship, our praise, and our celebration. So whether we call ourselves an aesthetic, a naturalist, a sensate, an intellectual, or any other label, no matter what our preference is in the way that we desire to connect with and move into and worship God, God is beyond and bigger and larger than all of those things. And those well-traveled pathways in your own life are an invitation for you to not only get to know who Jesus is more and more and more, but to invite others along on the journey with you. So if you have got love going nature walking and you love to ex- experience God through those things, My encouragement to you is this week, take somebody with you, somebody that you don't normally go walking with, and invite them into the way that you worship God, in the way that you connect with them. And I know that's going to be a a, a tough thing, because they might be be loud on their walk. They might talk when you want to be quiet. But guess what? Worship is not about you. Worship is about the risen King Jesus. And what a privilege it is to invite others in our lives along the pathway with us as we walk towards our risen Savior. My hope, my prayer, 
is that we would be a people who would love and live like Jesus. Jesus who patterned his life in subservient submission and worship and dedication to the one who sent him, his Father in heaven, the same one who sends us. So here today, what I encourage you to do is be moved and motivated by the reverence of God, the marvel of God, the majesty of God. Take one of these worship styles out for a spin, and let's go deep with Jesus. Let's stop expecting others to cater to our preferences, and instead be captivated by a risen, living, breathing king who is more full of love than any one of us will ever will be. If you're interested in this resource, it's going to be available online in our social medias as early as tomorrow. But we also have paper copies here today at the Next Steps kiosk. So you can go and you can chat with whoever's manning that space and that table and pick up your copy. Take it out for a spin. Like a like a summer road trip adventure. Your roadmap to experiencing Jesus in new and greater and deeper ways. Some which may be familiar and some which may be brand new. And how cool is that? Let me pray for us here today. Father, I'm so grateful that we can be motivated by and captivated by these ancient words that were written well before any of us were alive. Father, I'm thankful that David was a man that was motivated and inspired by the sheer wonder of who you are. A guy that experienced great forgiveness and great pain and great suffering all simultaneously at times. And yet found a way to go deep in his walk with you. And here today, Lord, that is my prayer for myself and so many of us that are gathered in this space and those who are tuning in online, whether that's on our podcast or live as we're streaming. My hope, my desperation for each of us is that this insatiable hunger for more of you, Jesus, would grow and grow and grow in us so that our lives would be a living reflection of who you have created human beings to be. We want to be known for our love, the way that we love you, Jesus, and the way that we live like you, Jesus. Would you help us to grow? Would you help us to see? Would you help us to heal? In Jesus' name, amen.